Bueno, es un gusto muy grande para mí introducir a nuestro orador en esta tarde, al economista Anwar Shaikh. Tuve el gusto, como muchísimos economistas de nuestro país y en particular de mi generación, de escuchar de Anwar Shaikh en la década del 90, en particular en el año 1995. En ese momento, las autoridades de la Facultad de Ciencias Económicas de la UBA decidieron de un día para el otro llevar adelante una reforma de los contenidos de la carrera de economía, cercenando la carrera, ajustando contenidos y básicamente instalando una suerte de envasado sobre cómo tenía que ser la formación de los economistas en nuestro país, pavimentando también el camino para una futura privatización, que afortunadamente, parcialmente, pero no totalmente, no sucedió. En ese momento lo que terminó generando este intento de cercenarnos y acotarnos a nuestra formación, a quienes militábamos en la Facultad de Económicas en la UBA, fue un proceso que en realidad terminó en todo lo contrario. Nos movilizó a buscar nuevos pensadores, nuevas ideas, a rechazar el pensamiento único, acercándonos al pensamiento crítico. Y en ese momento se creó en Económicas algo que se llamaron los talleres de economía política. Empezamos, quienes estudiamos en esa época, Axel era uno de los referentes de la carrera en ese momento, empezamos a leer, a hacer cosas tan revolucionarias, ¿no? como leer a Smith, leer a Ricardo, leer a Marx, y también empezamos a leer a Anwar Shaikh. En particular me acuerdo, pensando para esta sesión, que el libro de Anwar de 1990, Valor, Acumulación y Crisis, Ensayos de Economía Política, era casi una referencia obligada para quienes queríamos salir de los corsets que nos estaba dando la formación ortodoxa, mainstream, de economía en la UBA, y empezar a expandir nuestras fronteras del conocimiento. Y discutimos muchísimo a Yaik. Y además encontramos en Yaik una suerte de, de respiro intelectual, ¿no? un oasis en el cual encontrar una crítica que estaba puesta en términos teóricos y que se correspondía con lo que cada uno de nosotros vivía y sentía todos los días en las aulas, en plena década del 90, resistiendo el neoliberalismo en la Universidad de Buenos Aires. Lo que encontrábamos cuando leíamos a Yaik es que todos aquellos supuestos de la economía ortodoxa, en realidad estaban mal, no solo porque no reflejaban en nada el funcionamiento real del capitalismo. O sea, la competencia no solo no era perfecta, como decían los manuales de economía, sino que tampoco los, las, los supuestos de competencia perfecta, de homo economicus, de mercados que se equilibraban, en realidad aportaban ninguna claridad para comprender el funcionamiento del capitalismo. O sea, los supuestos eran equivocados y también las conclusiones a las cuales nos llevaban esos modelos eran absolutamente equivocados. Y lo que encontramos en Shaikh es una crítica muy fuerte a esa síntesis neoclásica keynesiana con la cual nos fuimos educando generaciones de economistas y lamentablemente todavía se educan hoy en Argentina y en el mundo muchísimos economistas. Pero en Shaikh encontramos mucho más que eso. Encontramos una teoría económica alternativa. O sea, Yaik, y creo que la gran genialidad y el valor de su aporte es que no solo hace una crítica contundente, de fondo, a la teoría económica neoclásica, sino que lo que él nos va a compartir hoy es parte de una visión alternativa, teóricamente muy sólida, de cómo funciona la sociedad capitalista. Y es una labor ambiciosa, es una labor enorme. Un economista hace poco describió el último libro de Anwar Yaik, que se publicó hace dos años, como una hazaña, y dijo, es un libro profundamente erudito y bellamente escrito, es a la vez una impresionante renovación de la economía clásica y keynesiana, y una implacable demolición de los sofismas, un libro para saborear y enseñar, no ha tenido uno igual durante 150 años. Esto es lo que lo transformó a, a Shaikh en un gran referente del pensamiento heterodoxo. Porque nos dio las herramientas para criticar con seriedad, con contundencia, las bases de la teoría económica neoclásica, del neoliberalismo, pero también nos ofrece una teoría alternativa. Shaikh no nos habla además de una teoría que cambia en el margen. Él no reemplaza el concepto de competencia perfecta por un concepto de competencia imperfecta. Él habla de la competencia en términos reales, de la competencia real. O sea, desarrolla una nueva categoría de conceptos 
sobre la inflación, sobre el tipo de cambio. Y además ya hay que incorpora dos conceptos que se mencionaron mucho en el, en el panel anterior y que para nosotros como jóvenes economistas fueron y siguen siendo fundamental. Ustedes saben que la teoría económica mainstream prácticamente no habla de la crisis, porque entiende que la economía básicamente funciona en el equilibrio, que los mercados se autorregulan, se autoequilibran y que las crisis son más bien la excepción. Nosotros como latinoamericanos sabemos que la crisis puede ser mucho más que la excepción. Ya ahí que incorporó la crisis, incorporó el concepto de teoría eh, de, de explotación y de ganancia, incorporó y nos mostró y nos muestra que la lucha de clases tiene que estar imbrincada, inserta en la discusión económica. Algunos años después fue muy lindo reencontrarnos con Shaik cuando nos abrió a muchos economistas argentinos las puertas de la New School for Social Research, donde él desarrolla sus investigaciones en el corazón de Nueva York, para compartir nuestras ideas, para presentar nuestra particular visión, por ejemplo, sobre lo que pasaba en Argentina con la batalla con los fondos buitre, Axel Kisiliov, yo, la presidenta misma, estuvo en la New School for Social Research, Cristina. Muchísimos economistas encontramos en esa institución un espacio para compartir una visión alternativa desde el sur, latinoamericana y heterodoxa. Y además, Anwar, descubrimos, es un gran conocedor de Argentina y de Sudamérica, no porque él estudie específicamente las economías periféricas, porque no es específicamente su área de estudio, pero está casado con una chilena, ha venido muchísimo a Argentina, tiene muchos discípulos argentinos, con lo cual fue un gran acompañante de los procesos de redistribución, de búsqueda de soluciones en políticas públicas alternativas que lleva adelante nuestro país hasta, hasta fines del 2015. Con todo esto, voy a tener el enorme gusto de dejarle este podio a Anwar Shahi, que él va a hacer una presentación de unos 20, 25 minutos. Después vamos a tener la posibilidad de dialogar con él, hacerle algunas preguntas. Y les cuento entonces que el título de su presentación, ambicioso por cierto, es una mirada crítica sobre la hegemonía intelectual del neoliberalismo. Muchísimas gracias. Um, I thank you for Claxco to inviting me for this uh, amazing conference. I had no idea of the reach and complexity and uh, power of the uh, enthusiasm that people have here and the, and the degree to which they like and want to see an alternate view of the system in which we all live. And thank you for Cecilia for being my ambassador. Uh, without her, I would not be here. I want to tell you that I began as a development economist. I am from Pakistan. I understand power, poverty, I understand backwardness, I understand dictatorship. And I came to Columbia University to study what I thought would help me understand how to improve the world. I was an engineer and I was very naive. I thought it was an engineering problem. But then I learned that the representation of capitalism that I was being given in my classes, given by the best, Gary Becker, my teacher, got a Nobel Prize, Bill Vickery, my teacher, got a Nobel Prize, Ned Phelps, macro Nobel Prize in economics, I'm going to come back to what that means, but they were talking, in my opinion, complete nonsense. They were representing capital, uh, capitalism in a way that was really uh, uh, a religious representation. And I'm not religious. So I had a difficulty with that. So I began to study anthropology, which at least talked about how real societies worked. Uh, and then I was told, uh, then I was in the building occupation in Colombia in 1968. Uh, that was a time when other people were also doing similar things, Mexico, Paris. We were a generation that thought we could change the world, and we did change the world somewhat, but not as much as we thought. Um, and I was then uh, encountering the work, works about Marx, and people told me, well, don't read Marx by yourself. It's really dangerous. 
And they're right, my head exploded. <laughs> and ever since, Marx's ideas have been an important part of my thinking. Uh, I mentioned this morning that the difficulty with Marx is not only was a genius in many, many fields, and many people cannot, most of us cannot follow him in all these fields, but he did not finish his damn work. He worked for 40 years in what has been called his beloved economics. He was going to write six books, not volumes, six books. And the first book was going to be four volumes, and he finished one. And the, and the consequence of that is what's left behind of Marx for economics is not adequate. Not because he didn't have the adequate foundation, but because he left only clues. It's a mystery story. I love mystery stories because in the end, everything works out nicely, which I like a lot. But if you come with Marx, there's no end. It's a mystery story with quotes here and quotes there. And I set myself a task of reading the... Um, classical economists, Smith, Ricardo, Marx, and of course Keynes, everybody read Keynes in those days, uh, to try to understand, is there buried here in this tradition a framework that could explain modern society, modern capitalist society? I'm very much in interested in the history of thought, but my interest was not about the history of thought. My interest was to be able to understand how capitalism works. And for many years, I have taught courses on that. I've encouraged people to, to do the same thing. And when we look at the present state of the world, the question that was posed for this conference, uh, trade wars, the rise of neo-fascism, inequality, financial bubble perhaps about to burst again, and the future of work with robotization, how do we analyze that? To analyze that, in my opinion, you need to understand how capitalism works. And I'm going to try to lay out, in a very general form, what I think are the central principles. Um, uh, I think it was mentioned, I have a book. Everybody has a book. Uh, it's called Capitalism, um, Conflict, uh, uh, Competition, Conflict, and Crises. The title alone took me a year, um, because it had to be just right. Um, and you can buy it on Amazon um, for about, I think, $35 now. And the paperback just came out, so it's going to be cheaper. Uh, but I have to say, it's not an easy book. I, I wrote it the way I did because I didn't want to die before it was finished. And it was such a big project, 30 years in the making, that I thought, you know, let me, let me get it out as I can. And I'm happy I did that. I'm proud of it. But it's only the beginning. It's really the beginning. I'm going to be writing a short version of the book. And then I'm writing another more popular book, which I would like to call Make Economics Great Again. <laughs> but uh, I could have a red hat, you know, hammer and sickle. It would be perfect. But anyway, I'm not sure they're going to accept that title. Um, so I want to begin by noting that industrial capitalism began in the West, and so it's not surprising that the initial great analyses of industrial capitalism came in the West. That's not to say that there are not many great analyses after that, and I'm gonna come back to that, but certainly Smith, Ricardo, Marx, and Keynes. And I wanna show you that there's a way to unite these different authors and their different concerns in a way that doesn't uh, that makes them fit together, analytical, but also empirical. I started life as an engineer, I started my education as an engineer, and I, as an aeronautical engineer, uh, aerospace engineer actually, and one thing I learned is that theory is not enough if it's too abstract. You do not build a rocket because it looks good on paper. Every aeronautical engineer will tell you they design the airplanes and they hire some crazy people to fly them because something may fall off. And then you say, well, back to the drawing board. But the person in the airplane may not be back to the drawing board. So we are interested in theory in order to uh, discipline our practice. And I'm going to come back to that point, how it relates to what happens in Latin America with Lula and Christina and all of that and the consequences. Uh, 
I have an article in, in FIDE, uh, just came out, which is about this subject, so if I don't get to it, uh, just to remind you it's in Spanish. The book has been translated into uh, Turkish, Chinese, and the Spanish translation, which is the slowest of all, is going to come out in six months. So hopefully you can read it in that form. I want to first now begin with the critical notion, uh, with the critical look of the intellectual hegemony of neoliberalism. It was not always like this. That's what I mean when I say I want to make economics great again. Economics was a social science, a historical science, an analytical science, an empirical science, and then something happened to move it away from those foundations to a kind of back to the religious view of marginalism and even more powerfully suppressed. For instance, I don't know if you know that there is no Nobel Prize in economics. It's actually the Swedish Central Bank Prize in honor, in memoriam of Alfred Nobel. And the Nobel family were appalled. Swedish Central Bank decides who gets this prize. They are the ones who decide. And it's not surprising that they picked Milton Friedman, the father of Chicago Boys, because they said explicitly in the formation of their prize in their own uh, archives that the purpose of the prize was to move economics and Western society away from the welfare state, against from liberalism and equality towards free market. Uh, I recommend you read a book called uh, The Nobel Factor by uh, the first author, the lead author, is a man named Avner Offer, O-F-F-E-R, and it's called The Nobel Factor because he got access to the archives of the Swedish Central Bank, so it's all laid out there what their intention was. The thing is that it was very, very successful. It basically eliminated from view other points of view and gave authority to everybody who was in this framework. Now, 10, 15 years afterwards, the, the Nobel Prize, Nobel uh, Swedish Central Bank Prize continues to be given, and there are more progressive people, Stiglitz, Krugman, but except for one or two, all of them were strict neoclassical economists. If you ask Krugman, he says, well, trade theory is from this framework. Ask Stiglitz, macro theory is from this framework. No other framework is allowed. So I call these the ayatollahs of economics. There are some progressive ones, and there are some reactionary ones, many more reactionary ones, but they will not let you consider another framework. Now, if we're going to consider another framework, what we cannot do, in my opinion, is to say that we modify it here and modify it there and add some imperfection there. No. You have to start from somewhere else. And that means just like Darwin had to start from the reality of life, not the imagined story of life of 5,000 some years, you have to start somewhere else. And that start is not something we have to do now. I don't like the idea of rethinking economics because that means you haven't really thought it in the first place. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. The, the rise of neoliberal economics was a process not only of presenting a certain point of view, which I have argued consistently is fictitious, but making you forget. Making you forget what happened before, representing in a way that's absurd so that you move away from it. And that making you forget is a very important mechanism because if you don't like it then, you think you have to reinvent everything. But you don't. Uh, my job was to excavate what had already been done and order it. I don't claim to have invented it. Some things I did invent, but lot, lot, most of it is on that foundation which was already there. And I was lucky. I was able to teach and explore that foundation in the new school, which is very rare. Um, what do things have been suppressed? Well, Marxism, classical economics in general, institutionalism, Keynesianism, uh, different traditions in different countries, the Ekla School, Samir Amin, Ernest Mandel, the writings of people about economics have been suppressed. And when you go to study economics, you have been given a religious education and you will not escape it by complaining about one aspect of it or not. You will not escape the church by saying that Eve was a feminist. Yeah, she was a feminist, but actually she was a fiction. She was not there. And if you focus on that, 
you remain trapped in that framework. So you have to, in my opinion, break free. When I say learning to forget, I always think of the, the movie uh, Men in Black. I don't know if you remember that movie, but there, it, the movie is, the premise of the movie is that Earth is populated by aliens. Mostly they were protected from seeing that, but sometimes we see the truth. And what they do is they raise this pen, which is called a neuralizer, they press a button, there's a flash, and you forget. That is the purpose of economics education now. It's a neuralizer. And you will not break that if you don't have some mechanism that will protect you. You know, the men in black wear glasses. They wear dark glasses. We need to have that kind of glass to protect us from this. So then this brings me, uh, I won't dwell on the, uh, well, I will come back to that. What is it that capitalism is driven by? What's the central thing that drives it? And the answer, which I elaborate at length in the book, is profit. It's a trivial answer. It's profit. It's not welfare. It's not growth. It's not equality. It's not the environment. It's not saving the system, the world. It's profit. And if you can make a profit by doing some good, that's great. If you can make a profit by doing some bad, it's equally great. Profit is, as uh, Piketty, Thomas Piketty says, it's amoral. It has no morality. It has only this goal. It advances ever forward to get more. Profit made is profit that must be reinvested to make more. So it doesn't mean that capitalism has no benefits. I mean, obviously, capitalism has greatly increased the standard of living of many uh, nations and peoples, even though at the same time it's decreased the standard of living of other nations and other peoples. Everybody knows that capitalism can come in and benefit some and destroy other aspects. Um, capitalism does not abolish cooperation. It channels it. Science, capitalist science, is cooperation, even though it may be cooperation to produce tobacco, which will kill you. But the thing is, they don't do it individually. They do it cooperatively, <laughs> right? So cooperation is not the issue. It's where it's directed that's the issue. The military is cooperation. Science in general is cooperation. Intellectual thought is cooperation. So we have to understand that the, the channeling mechanism is the key point. Now, what is the secret then of, of capitalism other than profit? It's this idea that competition among capitalists is what drives the system. Profit drives it. How does profit drives it? Every capitalist wants more, as Marx puts it, then they collide with each other. And that collision is driven by their own desire to have more, but it produces patterns which are not in their intention. Adam Smith calls that the invisible hand. But nowadays we call it, and we used to call it dialectics, but nowadays we call it emergent properties. And what that means is that the outcomes of these individual behaviors are not the intentional outcomes, but something that comes from their structure. From their so what are these outcomes? If capitalists uh, have see higher profit over there, they invest more over there. They increase the supply, they lower the price, and the profit goes down. Here, the supply decreases, price goes up, profit goes up. And so this creates a balance. But they don't mean by that it creates an equilibrium. It creates a turbulent pattern of ups and downs, what Marx calls a cycle of fat and lean years. And that means when we look empirically, I show in the book, you can actually see that. There is a turbulent equalization of profit rates on new investment. And that is the central ordering mechanism of relative prices, of interest rates, of stock market and bond prices, of uh, exchange rates, of the patterns of trade. Why, is, why should we care? Because if you're going to operate on capitalism, that's the things you need to know. Ask any leader, ask any Congress, ask any minister of finance or industry, that's what you need to know. You need to know how this system operates if you want to channel it and move in another direction. So what is it then that is the micro foundation of this? The micro foundation of it is real consumer behavior. If I ask everybody here, how do you operate? And anybody says, well, I'm a rational maximizer game theorist, then we have people waiting outside to take you to the asylum. 
because everybody knows that we are emotional beings, we're tribal beings, we make decisions quickly, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, but we're social beings. Imagine that in economics, abstracts from that, abstracts from the way we feel about other people. I read a book recently. I like to sort of wander in bookstores and take find books which are interesting. Usually they kick me out after a while, but um, I found a book called um, Confessions of a Sociopath. Excellent book, I recommend it. Uh, it's about a woman who is puzzled by her difficulty having relationships and their severe difficulties. She's a Mormon, actually, and she says, I'm a Mormon because it gives me a structure and gives me rules of how to behave because I don't feel how to behave. And she goes to a psychiatrist and he says, Madame, you're a sociopath. What he means by that is not that she's violent or, or mean necessarily, but that she doesn't experience any empathy or feeling for other people or other things. The story that she begins her book with is, She's a very successful lawyer and a law professor, and she's coming home, and she is a swimming pool, and she sees a little baby animal fallen in the swimming pool. That's the opening pages of her book. And she watches it, it's drowning. And then she takes a long stick with a net and goes towards that, and instead of doing what we would do, is pick up the animal, she pushes it under until it drowns. And then she goes home, calls her pool person, says there's something floating in my pool, get it out. Now, she tells that story because she wants to make us understand that she has no feeling for that. Now, what's the point about this in economics? How many people here have taken a course in economics? Okay, so you recognize the idea of a utility function. A utility function is something that's supposed to express your satisfaction, and the, it's a function meaning it depends on various things. What are those things? Things, they're commodities. There's, it's a, a total perfect case of commodity fetishism. But none of those things are allowed to interact. I ask my students, where's your mother? Where's your society? Where's your family? Where's your culture? Where's your football team even? It's not there. Because you are presented with an idea of people as being ultimately selfish and sociopathic. That's the model of human behavior from which orthodox economics, all the orthodox economics is built. And then they try to introduce a little bit, but you cannot do that because in it, all the other conclusions like optimality and efficiency fall apart if you say, if I don't choose to have more but give it to my family, I'm contradicting economics. But no, it's the other way around. Economics is contradicting me because it's inadequate. So. That is, from that framework, we can build a framework that explains all of the basic propositions of economics. Downward sloping demand curves, elasticities, these won't mean anything to you if you haven't taken microeconomics course, but they're the foundation of microeconomics. And the rest is essentially propaganda about the uh, ideal character of capitalism. But what about macroeconomics? I mentioned that the key driving force there is profitability. Now, Marx is the biggest uh, one to focus on this, but they all focus on the same thing. If prof capital moves from one place to another, where it's low profit here, high profit there, it does so because it expects to make profit, more profit. So the mobility of capital is motivated by the difference in profit. But it's not just a difference in profit, it's a difference between profit and the rate of interest. So if that difference is positive, greater somewhere else it moves there. And this is the source of the restless search of capital for higher profit. Lower wages makes the difference bigger. Lower interest rates make the difference bigger. Uh, uh, lower uh, prices for commodities, raw materials makes the difference bigger. And this is what motivates capital moving everywhere, across the globe. It's always moved across the globe. It began in England, jumped the channel to Europe. It spread through Europe. It was in uh, India, it was in Africa. It was everywhere, and now in another wave of globalization, there was a wave in the 1870s, there's another wave now. This is new in some aspects, but is not new in character. And that's something we have to remember. Globalization is the modern expression of the intrinsic properties of the system. Now this emphasis on profitability allows uh, me to link 
the classical tradition, which focuses on this mobility here and trade and exchange rates, with the Keynesian tradition, because the first thing that Keynes says is investment is determined by the difference between the rate of return on investment and the interest rate. He calls it the marginal efficiency of capital and the interest rate, but that's exactly the statement in Marx. Exactly, Marxists don't pay attention. Marx, nobody reads volume three of Marx, but it's in there, it's buried in there someplace. So it's possible then to show that this framework is capable of creating a foundation for Keynes. Keynes makes this emphasis, but he does not link profitability back to surplus value and the objective conditions the length of the working day. So it's possible, and I show in the book, that is, you can derive all the basic results of Keynesian economics as well as the basic results of microeconomics from just this simple link. It's not so simple in concrete, but anyway. Okay, so what um, does that mean? I want to talk about the implications, and then I'll stop because I promised 25 minutes, and I believe discipline should be an important feature of the left, so especially when it applies to you. Um, I want to argue that when we talk about a stimulus, the, the problem facing every progressive government is how to provide more employment, how to change poverty at the bottom. And that is, in fact, the task, the proper task. But why is it then that so many of these governments fail in their task? Why is it that they then produce outcomes that they don't want? And my argument is they produce those outcomes because they've forgotten the intrinsic link between stimulus and profitability. Let me just briefly explain that. I think I have time. In the 1930s, Hitler was faced with a country with such massive unemployment and such massive anger against the results, uh, the, the penalties after World War I and the just misery that the German people were suffering that he was able to rise to power. And that rise came on their bitterness and anger, but he was able to eliminate unemployment in one year. How did he do that? He didn't go to Columbia or MIT. He did it, actually, Keynes was amazed. Keynes said, in that situation, what you should do is you should drop money from an airplane and let people pick it up and they'll spend it. Or bury it in a coal mine deep and they will dig for it and they'll be able to have, why? Because with the money they have purchasing power. They can buy things in a capitalist economy. What Hitler did is he stimulated the economy through deficits and unemployment fell to zero. And yet there was no inflation, uh, no uh, reduction in, uh, no uh, rise in wages, uh, rapid rise in wages, and no fall in profitability. How did he do it? Well, he said, okay, you can't raise your wages. As <laughs> simple as that, you, you're not gonna raise your wages because then you'll pay a price. But he also said to the capitalists, you can't raise your prices. So they froze wages, froze prices, and he said to the central bank, reduce your interest rate so the state can borrow cheaply. And so he was able to break the link between stimulus, inflation, and profitability, and reduction of profitability. In World War II, Roosevelt did exactly the same thing once the war started. Stimulus, deficits that were the highest ever seen in the advanced world, uh, but wages were frozen because it was unpatriotic to raise your wages in the war effort. Prices were frozen also. That was called price gouging or profiteering, war profiteering. If you take advantage of a shortage by raising your price, you couldn't do it. And the central bank was asked to lower its interest rate. So after the end of World War II, everybody said, we are Keynesians now. Even Nixon said, we are Keynesians now. And what they meant is that they discovered the secret, which is that you can pump deficits and new money, credit, uh, into the economy and you'd reduce unemployment. But this time it didn't work. It worked at first. They pumped up m the economy through deficits, unemployment went down, and then it started creeping up. So they put more pumping. It went down again, then it started creeping up. It's like cocaine, I've been told. So <laughs> they kept doing more and the results were less. 
eventually they were getting very low growth and high inflation. And that was called stagflation. And that failure of Keynesian economics is what allowed the right wing to come back, what allowed neoliberalism to come back. Because objectively, the economy got worse. The working class shifted away from the idea of the welfare state and Keynesianism, saying, well, look, we're losing. We're uh, losing our jobs. We're suffering inflation. And so they shifted to Reagan, who promised them, and Thatcher in England, promised them a better deal. And you know what? They got it. They got it because those people lowered the wages in real terms. They increased the profit rates, so growth were increased. Unemployment went down. And they gave them what they promised. And that is a lesson that Keynesians could not understand because they missed the link between the stimulus and the possible negative impact on profitability. I'm going to come back to that just at the very end. So what does that tell us? It tells us that stimulus, uh, redistribution of income, all of which are things I support. I absolutely think there are things that need to be done. But capitalism has its own mechanisms of reaction. And that mecha those mechanisms require wages to not rise faster than productivity. So what does that mean? One solution is to repress wages so that they stay below productivity. The other solution, which I call the Swedish solution, is to enhance productivity so that wages can rise also and so that you keep within the limits. Because if you go faster than productivity in real wages, the wage share rises, the rate of surplus value falls, and the profit rate falls. And that fall, at some point, will feed back on the system. Not because there are capitalists sitting in a room somewhere going, we're going to on capitalist strike, or we're plotting against it. They do that anyway. That's because something objective is happening. And that objective effect is uh, has its effects on the working class. They're the ones who lose their jobs. They're the ones who have inflation. They're the ones who suffer when the economy collapses. And they turn to the right, because we have shown them that we cannot serve them, as it, which is our task. Um, this solution has strong limits. And perhaps I can talk about that else in, in the question. But it is possible. It may be slower. It is possible if we understand that there are two sides to that equation, not just one. Uh, let me end by saying that um, global employment is something that expresses another tendency of capitalism, or more malign tendency, which is that productivity growth and mechanization replaces workers. Uh, sometimes it's, it's inspired by a lack of workers. Uh, they were mentioning in California now, because the immigrants have been blocked from coming, thanks to ever-wise Trump, they don't have uh, migrant workers, so they're now getting robotic pickers of, uh, of uh, fruits and agricultural products, because the shortage of labor makes it profitable to use these robotics. They were not profitable before, because the labor was cheap. When the labor becomes scarce and expensive, it is profitable. So capitalism finds its way around these obstacles. The difficulty is, on a global scale, that also leads to a real problem of employment. We often talk about the reserve army of labor in Marx's description, but that is never meant to be a, in a country. It's meant to be wherever capital can go. And that is now the rest of the world. Almost every country capital can go to whether well, it's American capital, or Chinese capital, or British capital, or Japanese capital, it has access to these resources and to labor. And that may harm the US. It may harm Europe. But it will not harm US profits. It will not harm European profits. Because the object is not to benefit the world or the, or the country. The object is to make profit. And so I often think that if you want to understand how capitalism works, read, go watch The Godfather again, <laughs> because that's how it works. And we have to understand that if we're going to proceed. We can proceed. We can uh, intervene, but not if we misunderstand what the purpose is. Thank you. Yeah. 
Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Anwar Shaik, por tu exposición. Le voy a hacer ahora una pregunta a Anwar y vamos a dar espacio para que haya dos o tres preguntas del público. Sabemos que hay muchas ganas de preguntar. Los tiempos son cortos. Fue mi mamá que nos donó su eh, auricular, gracias. Bueno, ¿me escuchas, Samuel? Uh, yes. ¿En inglés? Yeah. Sí. Ok. Bueno, la, la primera pregunta que queríamos compartir eh, tiene que ver con la acción. El foro que planteamos para hoy, lo decíamos esta mañana en la apertura, se propone comprender este mundo en disputa. Hola. You have to. It was okay before. It was okay. Uh, let me just check. I think it's three. Can you El mundo que buscamos hoy nos bus nos propone transformar. Esto no es verdad. Anwar, ¿me estás escuchando la traducción correctamente? Los intérpretes están haciendo la traducción, ¿verdad? Ah, y la otra está allá. Hola. Ok, perfecto. Bueno, gracias. Retomamos entonces. El propósito del foro, tal como lo presentamos esta mañana, incorporaba la comprensión de estas hegemonías globales en disputas, de las disputas intelectuales, las disputas políticas, las disputas económicas, pero también una vocación de transformación, una vocación de cambiar los, las, los resultados y la emergencia del neoliberalismo y el fortalecimiento en muchos sentidos, y en particular en nuestra región del neoliberalismo. Entonces la primera pregunta que te queríamos hacer, Anwar, era ¿qué hacer? ¿Qué hacer como latinoamericanos, qué hacer como progresistas para trabajar en una alternativa al neoliberalismo? Okay, um, I, I'm an economist, so I strongly believe that economics has a power. And so the first thing is to take back in the education of economics the ground that was lost, the ground that we were forced to forget. That means in your universities, not just neoclassical economics, but every other kind of economics. Let them, if they believe it's the best, let them confront on equal terms. Now that is not what happens. All these universities prevent people from speaking. I went to Columbia University. I cannot go back to Columbia University to speak as an economist. I can speak as an econophysicist, but I cannot speak as an economist. I can't go to Harvard as an economist or MIT. I was recently at MIT visiting a mathematician friend. I cannot walk to the next building where the economists are because they would not allow me to do that. Here you have that possibility because you had a strong labor movement, a strong political movement, And you must not let economics be reduced to just one point of view. I'm not saying to abolish it. We teach in the new school orthodox economics also. But we don't teach it in a way that is insulated from discussion and criticism. So the first thing is take back. The second thing is to recover your memory. History of economic thought, in my opinion, is not about learning what other people said just for that, but I'm learning what other people said because it was better. 
And if you don't know that, you will be forced to reinvent, and you are not going to reinvent Smith, Ricardo, Marx, or Keynes. None of us is going to just reinvent that any more than you could reinvent Mozart or Darwin. So start by doing what can be done, occupy economics, and then let's see what happens. There's a second aspect to that. Macroeconomic policy has been constructed out of the theory of neoclassical economics and the practice of Keynesian economics. And these theory and practice are not consistent. So any good political person understands that there are people who have done things that worked and these things hopefully will work. But the point I made earlier, the point of my FIDE article, I'm returning to my roots as a development economist, is that we can understand why it works when it works, and we can understand why it fails when it fails, and we can avoid the second if we pay attention to the causes. I don't mean by that that you can abolish poverty if you just have the right textbook. I mean by that that you have some idea what the limits are. And if those limits uh, are there, you can negotiate and move around them. And I'm speaking only of macro policies, not the transformation of the economy. I think capitalism actually is very strong in that it can absorb every point of view. It can, in my opinion, absorb feminism. It can absorb the civil rights movement. It can absorb the gay rights movement. If those movements are only about moving some people up the pyramid to the top. But if those movements are about changing the structure of capitalism, then they become dangerous. And we need to be more dangerous. Bueno, acá hay unos cuantos peligrosos. Afortunadamente hemos ocupado el Centro Cultural San Martín y estamos trabajando para ocupar la economía. Vamos a tomar algunas preguntas, sí, antes de terminar este panel. Nos vamos a quedar con ganas, pero aunque sea podemos escuchar algunas opiniones y dudas. Sí, por favor. Yeah, my name is Rodrigo Borges. I come from Brazil. I had the opportunity to read your book. I really thank you for your effort. It's great. I had the opportunity to start teaching it in microeconomics at the university, I, I thought. And one thing that I didn't find in your book that kept me thinking is about uh, how Hitler broke the links with some repressions uh, at, and a side of monetary credit side and the uh, wage side. Uh, why I ask you if you think there could be other ways of breaking the links when trying to think about the transition out of capitalism. Because there was a debate in the Latin America about Chile, three Chile's transition. I would like to know what you think about other ways, popular ways of breaking those links. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Tomamos dos preguntas más, por favor. Si te puedes parar, por favor. Hola, soy Víctor Orellana de Chile del Frente Amplio. Quiero hacer dos preguntas bien breves, en inglés o en español, en español mejor. Sí, mejor. Eh, primera pregunta, ¿qué opina de eh, profesor Chaik de quienes ha sostenido que la forma del valor, de, eh, como usted lo plantea en sus trabajos, que es la manera en que los valores de uso y los procesos concretos se hacen, se transforman en una totalidad social y se, y se presentan como totalidad de trabajo? Si esa forma, como Marx la estudiaba, que cada vez era más compleja, en el, en el libro 1, 2 y 3, que va, se, se va volviendo más compleja, ¿estamos ante un momento en que esa forma sea anacrónica, como han sostenido otros eh, investigadores o no? Y segunda pregunta, eh, ¿cómo nos ayudaría a imaginar los procesos de desmercantilización? Porque una cosa es cómo nosotros intervenimos sobre el capitalismo y otra que es particularmente importante en mi país, en Chile, que las fuerzas sociales no hemos propuesto y populares no hemos propuesto sacar el capitalismo de algunos espacios de los derechos sociales donde lo instaló el neoliberalismo. ¿Es eso posible o nos debemos contestar solo con una como conducción y canalización consciente de las formas capitalistas de transformar cada carrera, cada universidad en la totalidad del valor, que es que la manera que el capital lo hace. Eso. Bueno, muchas gracias. Y una última pregunta acá, una mujer, tenemos. Dale, vamos. Hola, gracias. sí, de la Universidad Nacional de Córdoba. 
Quería preguntarle al profesor, porque de, del escenario que él plan, planteó y de acuerdo a lo que los compañeros preguntaron, nos quedamos, o al menos yo, el mensaje cuál es frente a la crisis, digamos, frente a la crisis particular que estamos viviendo en general en el capitalismo, pero en los países periféricos y frente a un escenario de cambio, esperemos. Eh, de acuerdo a lo que comentaba el profesor, quiero decir esto con cautela, era como que el escenario viene a ser como un congelamiento general ¿no? para poder salir de la crisis. Digamos, esta paridad entre una competitividad y los precios y los salarios... Eh, la pregunta, digamos, lo, lo que entendí era justamente congelar todo para, para poder dar ese empuje para salir de una crisis, ¿no? Eso nos plantea un escenario en los países periféricos un poco complejo. ¿Cómo entran en esto que está planteando el profesor la posibilidad de lograr algunos consensos, algunos acuerdos entre capital y trabajo en términos económicos para poder eh, pensar más allá de un congelamiento quizás? No sé. Bueno, gracias. Anwar. Um, let me start with the first question, which is, <coughs> was it Hitler's repression that allowed him to break that link? And the answer is yes, surely. If you tried to raise your wages, then Hitler's people would come and kill you, take you away. The unions were broken. But they also did the same thing to the capitalist class. If you tried to raise your prices, they would come to you also. So it wasn't just the working class that was repressed. It was anyone who was going to go against that program. Hitler was known for this totality approach, and it worked in that sense. But Roosevelt did not do it that way, mostly. Roosevelt kept uh, people from raising their wages by exhorting them to support the war effort. So it's a seduction rather than a threat. Not entirely seduction, because if you tried to do it in the unions, then they would come and talk to you, but it wasn't the same thing. Capitalists also were the power, after all, were also told, you can't do this, it's a war effort, and you are going against a nation, and you will be exposed as a profiteer. Now, it was not completely effective, but it was remarkably effective. And the central bank was in control, was controlled by the state in both of those instances, and they lowered it. So then the question arises, can we escape that limit for some length of time by what the Keynesians used to call incomes policy, which is keeping incomes in line with productivity or lower, but also stimulating productivity. If you were in a war, people would do it. You can say to people, well, some people at the top may have their wages lower and some people at the bottom higher. We can do it post-tax. I haven't discussed the uh, story of the empirical treatment of inequality, but let me tell you a story about the research that I did with a group of students. I couldn't have done what I did without the students because they work with me, they teach me, they disagree with me, and it's through that process that we learn, I learn. So we started a project to ask what the welfare state did. Many people believe that the welfare state was very successful in taking income from the, working, from the capitalist class to the working class through taxation. And then at some point, the welfare state ceased to work because the capitalist class turned against it. But that's not true. In Sweden, we found something that surprised me greatly that if you add up all the taxes taken by worker, taken from workers, social security, education, all these taxes that come out of your wages, and you compare them to what you get back, transfer payments, health, education, parks, even roads for private transportation, the two are the same. And where they varied across countries, they seldom varied by more than three or four um, percent. I have an article on my homepage. All my articles on my homepage are there. That's strictly speaking illegal, so don't tell publishers. But I put them on as soon as they're published. And this one is called, Who Pays for the Welfare State? Now, why do I bring that up? Because the left seems to think that the welfare state was a burden on capitalism. It was not a burden on capitalism. It was not a burden on the working class either, because it gave them in return 
largely for what they took, uh, what they paid. The difference is that in Sweden, workers understood that they were getting it back. In the US, they thought it was money going to the poor and the immigrants and black people, and they were encouraged to think that way. So they began to oppose it. So the role of persuasion is very important, the role of explaining what this is. Now, that does not mean that all workers will uh, uh, approach that. We, we found that what is happening then, if workers are paying for their own welfare, so to speak, but the workers at the top are paying more than they get back, and the workers at the bottom are getting back more than they pay. If the political movement cannot persuade them to do that, then, um, um, I can't read your handwriting. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry, <laughs> that's okay. So if the political movement cannot persuade them to do this, then they will break away. The ones at the top will break away. And many people at the top don't think of themselves as working class. But Sweden did it, so it's not impossible. France did it, and it's not impossible. And we need to be able to understand how to do the political work to make it plausible. And one way is to make it transparent. Explain to them where the money is going and where it's coming back, rather than to hide it in a budget and talks of economists and so on. It's possible. I believe, I'm a teacher. I believe in persuasion. Otherwise, I have no tool whatsoever. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Anwar. Vamos a cerrar aquí esta conferencia con un aplauso, por favor.